And let me then move to the second related feature and do that through the second riddle. Second riddle was, why didn't Darwin use the word evolution? He doesn't. As I said, he called the process descent with modification. Neither did most of the other major early and mid-19th century evolutionists. Lamarck, for example, talks about transformisme, transformism. Heckel in Germany talks about Abstammungslehre, or the doctrine of descent. They do not call it evolution. Why not? And I think the answer is actually pretty simple. It's a much shorter riddle than the first one. I've got some slides to show. The word evolution was a perfectly good English vernacular word at the time, and it meant progress. It was a largely poetic word. It comes from the Latin evolutio, which is unfolding, and it refers to a kind of predictably progressive upward unfolding. Now, Darwin never would have chosen that vernacular English word for the process. Why? Because his theory, almost uniquely among other proposed 19th century mechanisms, his theory of evolution has no inherent vector of progress in the basic mechanics. Now, Darwin is an eminent Victorian, managed to smuggle progressivist notions through subsidiary ecological arguments. He was too eminent a Victorian to do away with it altogether. But Darwin was delighted in recognizing that what I like to call the bare bones mechanics of his theory included no statement about progress. In that universal predictable sense of a cosmic betterment, what Darwin's theory is about is only adaptation to changing local circumstances. That's all it is. Yes, the mammal with hair is a better elephant for a cold environment, but it's not a better elephant in any cosmic sense. All you get out of Darwinism is adaptation to changing local circumstances. That's all. There is no inherent, predictable, progressivist component. And that's very frightening to many of us who wish to see human beings as the end result of a predictable, progressive process. And we want to see whatever evolutionary mechanism we allow producing this in some intrinsic way. Darwin was very clear on that. The office I live in now at Harvard used to belong to an American paleontologist named Alpheus Hyatt, who believed in inherently progressive evolution. Darwin had a long correspondence with him and eventually wrote in some frustration to Hyatt. After long reflection, Darwin writes, I cannot avoid the conclusion that no inherent tendency to progressive development exists. Now, there is no greater bias to this day in pop culture understanding of evolution than this misequation of the concept of evolution with progress. And I'd like to show a series of slides that illustrate that and then give you a better take on what Darwinism is about. And uh, in fact, we'll show all the slides right now. This first to make a general point about Darwin's radicalism. Our standard picture of Darwin is as an old man living in his country home, the sage of down, if you will. And somehow it's hard to see a man so genial and so elderly as a great source of radical innovation. Now, that's a terrible ageist prejudice anyway, but such that it is. I would like to point out, this is a frontispiece that a colleague of mine drew several years ago. It's uh, meant to be humorous, but it makes a serious point. It says how Charles Darwin might have looked as a modern graduate student just back from five years of field work. This picture is intended to fix in readers' minds that Darwin was at his most innovative at this age. And that's right. Darwin's great theorizing was done in his late 20s and early 30s. This is the Darwin who shook up the intellectual world and should be so seen. Now, I'll show you my favorite symbolic representation of Darwin's radicalism, and then we will go into the sequence of slides on progress. Now, this actually happened. This is not a studio set up. This is the campus of Stanford University after the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco. And what we see is the statue of Louis Agassiz overturned with its head in the bottom. Now, here's the point about this. You have to understand. Louis Agassiz built the museum at Harvard that I work in. He was the last great creationist scientist. He was an ichthyologist, a student of fishes by profession. He never abandoned creationism, died unconverted in 1873 the last great scientific creationist. Another scene of the whole. See, I take this as symbolic of Darwin's overturning of the world. There's Agassiz upended and askew by Darwin. Now, there's a wonderful story that arose out of this, which deserves to be true, but this one isn't. The president of Stanford University at the time was David Starr Jordan. Now, David Starr Jordan, in his earlier life, before he became an administrator, was one of the greatest American Darwinian scientists. And he was an ichthyologist, too. So he and Agassiz shared the same specific subject, fishes. But whereas Agassiz was a creationist, David Starr Jordan was one of the first 
great evolutionists in Darwinian sense. And Jordan is said to have taken one look at that and remarked that, oh, well, he had always thought better of Agassiz in the concrete than in the abstract anyway. So.